In today's version of the game Geometry Dash, the concept of cheating or hacking with external software is trivial. There are even softwares that are integrated into the game itself as an interface of ready-to-use exploits and cheats, the most well-known one called Megahack, developed by Absolute. Ever since the 2.0 update, hacking and exploits began their story by being looked down upon until eventually evolving, or devolving, depending on who you talk to, into what it has become today. Whether you are a player or creator exclusively, pretty much all the big names use hacks of some degree with varying levels of influence on the game functionality. I'm no exception, I do it as well. A question that might be a bit difficult for people to answer is, how did players hack the game in the mobile days when the PC version was not out yet? Of course, the easy answer is they were using external apps to speed hack mobile games, and in some instances, yes, this is correct. Another answer is that they would just cut the video, like many known players have, such as Neptune, Cyclic, Ramo, and more, which yes, this is also correct. There are many, many derivatives that start from cutting, which there are probably way too many examples to list. In other instances though, this is not correct at all, as they used some other and more unique methods to hack the game. This video will go through majority of the known ones used over the years, going from the earliest to more recent. Let's begin. This isn't much of a hacking method, but this is more to give a statement on the earliest possible situations of cheating for gain. Throughout the game's first years, secret ways have time and time again showed up in levels, the earliest known example of a rated level utilizing this being BP Knight, which was rightfully unrated when discovered. Even in today's era of the game, secret ways can be found pretty much in any common level. The hardest demons used to utilize secret ways as well, but nowadays, the extensive efforts going towards legitimacy concerns in top levels is endless. As such, this is all that can be discussed regarding secret ways. So at the turn of 2014, players had to become a bit more creative. The first player that would achieve this would be Sun on 924. When Sun the 924 uploaded the Hell series, there's a reason the levels look like they're from the 1.2 version of the game despite being uploaded in the 1.4 version of the game. In 1.0, it was possible to verify levels using practice mode. Yeah, really. For some reason. If you beat the level in practice, you verify the level. This was later patched out pretty quickly, but not properly since the bug would keep existing until 1.2, then officially patched in 1.2.1. The problem with this, however, is that back then, the game did not check what version of the game you were using. This meant even when the game was in version 1.5, it was possible to keep uploading levels in older versions. The Hell series were uploaded using this exploit, hence why they looked outdated even for when they were uploaded. In terms of exploits, however, this series are the only levels known to have exploited this glitch and gotten away with ratings. On the 26th of April 2014, Reflection exposed Sun 94 on the Korean Geometry World Forum for his attempts, jumps and time spent on verification, and that it did not make sense if Sun had been playing from 0% the whole time. AGW admin would later contact Robtop upon the discovery of this exploit, and after the Hell series was unrated on May 2014, the exploit was patched out by not allowing players to play in that version anymore, which later evolved into not being allowed to play older versions, period. The next exploit the players began to use was speed hacking, as many would guess. The popular choice for this before the PC version showed up was the SB Game Hacker app. It is described on their website as the easiest and most powerful game modifier, and there's a guide explaining to you exactly how to use it. Much like any other mobile game, Geometry Dash was a perfect candidate to use this software on. In terms of significant levels they used this exploit to verify levels were Majako's unnerf levels such as Stereo Demoness and Sam Till. This GW post is now deleted, but Majaka would funnily enough give himself away using it when showcasing Silent Hill. The slider in the middle, showcased by accident, decides how quick or slow the game should run, and this image being set to 1, which is default speed. But he was not the only user of this exploit. At this point of the game, the community would genuinely turn insane, releasing multiple levels to utter this day near impossible garbage mess. Megadeer, Roadbows, Majako, Black Peach is full, all very likely users of speed hack on mobile devices. Even to this day, speed hacking is commonly used even among top players that beat the hardest demons. At this point, speed hacking has also evolved further on the PC version, but we'll come back to that later.
The foundations for this exploit is uncertain, because it is not 100% confirmed which level actually began using this exploit first. The first popular instance of this exploit was in the level Silent Club uploaded by Black P2S4, where a player hit a blue orb in practice mode and paused the game on the same frame. Once you exited the practice run, the next attempt from zero would start upside down, and if a secret way was set up, you would hit some form of portal catching you and you fly to the end of the level. It is rather ironic that Silent Club was the level mostly known for this exploit, because there's no record of this exploit ever working in this level in the 1.6 version. It does work in the 2.0 version because of additional features that allowed you to glide on the ground for longer. But ever since then, the secret way has never worked. One theory of what the purpose of that portal was in Silent Club was to test the sync of the entire level since P2S couldn't really play a level that difficult himself. This is not the only level to use this glitch though. Some levels that utilize this glitch to some extent was levels like Collaboration Theory by Aquarius, Relativo by Dyrox, Project Inferno by Drybones, and Vega by Veloci. Despite the knowledge of this glitch, other than some 1.9 impossible levels that were probably verified using this glitch, there aren't any levels that really used this and became popular for it, rather underused compared to the other methods on here. Either way, it was briefly worth talking about in this video. Compared to other methods, this is a bit of a unique situation because only one user ever gained anything from this. On the 14th of May 2014, the first ever server attack took place which attacked multiple uploader levels and changed them into something explicit. On top of that, additional levels were uploaded by one user which in-game was just named Player, but players found out that the hacker's actual username was Hman. If you are unfamiliar with Geometry Dash, these images might not seem very crazy, but through normal means, the highest number of stars you will get from a rated level is 10 stars. These exploited levels would give you 127 stars each, and be an entirely empty level or containing some form of explicit creation. Funnily enough, Hman would also call out Robta for his poor server security by uploading some exploited levels that specifically say that Robta needs to fix his servers. The only form of gain that Hman got from this was being able to climb the Creator Points leaderboard or the top star grinder list, which at the time, there was a list that ranked the top star grinders of that week. The mischief caused by Hman was very quickly patched up, but surprisingly, Robtop would not attempt to actually fix the issue with the servers, as would be evident in the upcoming years. But we'll get into that a bit later. Before moving on, I want to show you the first ever bot that plays Geometry Dash for you, and is one of the most primitive creations I think I've ever seen. What we have here is a bot programmed using the open source hardware Arduino. It has been programmed so that it works like a timed macro, meaning that every input in the bot has been manually programmed, much like you would do a macro recording with modern programs today. For some nerdy trivia, the console showcasing numbers display two variables that play a significant role in the program. The I variable counts the amount of inputs that the program has done, and the B variable calculates the distance between the clicks. The big difference here compared to a standard macro of today is that this bot's inputs are manually coded, and they need to be recoded for every level that you want the bot to play. A method like this to attempt to cheat is not really sustainable due to the extreme nature of the gameplay that would come up in levels after 2014, but I want to briefly mention this since it is such a cool piece of history. This is not a hacking exploit in itself, but since it was exclusively used for cheating for a time, this will briefly be mentioned here. There are many instances of video cutting to try and hide the fact that the levels played were not legitimately beaten. Probably the earliest instance of this that comes to mind is Neptune's verification videos, where the most obvious cuts are in the last levels he built, such as Necropolis and Theory of Everything 2 version 2. At the time, the idea of cutting videos wasn't a thought that players considered, hence when this trend began you were able to get away with it. Initially, the way players detected cheaters was through the pulsing and speed hacking, but some time later, players will begin to notice something that gives away cutting, which is two factors. One factor that gives away a cut is if it cuts on a rotating object, like a bus saw. If the video has been cut at that point with the bus saw on screen, there's a pretty big chance that the rotating object will start rotating the other direction. In 2.1, you can now set the direction for which way the rotation will turn, but back in the 1.8 to 1.9 days, they were randomized with no way of altering them. The other factor that was the biggest giveaway was that much like the rotation of objects, the position of the background is randomized, and when cutting, it is possible to notice that the background suddenly switches position immediately. 
Other than Neptune, another popular player that was caught doing this was Cyclic when uploading his The House on Roof Vacation video. Even Riot would be spending time exposing players for cutting videos and slowly but surely the community was very familiar in how to detect video cutting. The method slowly died and when later versions of the game came out, the community would become more devious with their methods. There is one more exploit that allowed players to cheat and verify impossible levels of which wasn't really put on public display until years after it was patched out. And that is the game Guardian exploit. This became more commonly used during the 1.8 to 2.0 era of the community, where random impossible levels would show up where even speed hacking them seemed like an impossible task. The first level that truly kickstarted this confusion was Silent Clubstep uploaded by Salent. Sobros made a practice mode video on the level and it would create a chain of events that kicked the level's reputation into immortality, as even 7 years later this level is still talked about on a regular basis. But even then, the way the level was verified was still a confusion, since even speed hacking this level would be really difficult. The short answer to how this level was verified was that it wasn't. The Game Guardian exploit is what allowed you to trick the game into thinking a level was verified. Game Guardian is a hack or alteration tool that can be used to configure variables in a mobile game, which depending on the game can be pretty much anything. To explain this in a simple manner, the tool allowed access to setting the variable for verified from 0 to 1. Many of the old impossible levels from the 1.9 era were released using this exploit, meaning that anyone could make it as difficult as they wanted. Many of the big impossible levels were all verified using this exploit. Silent Clubstep, Silent Poltergeist, Deadly Clubstep version 2, Old Slaughterhouse, Old Death Corridor, Silent Circles. The exploit since then has been patched out, and the final level verified using this exploit by Salent was Silent Poltergeist. For the later 2.0 levels mentioned, this exploit would evolve into being utilized in a different software made for PCs, as with the speed hacking exploit. The software is incredibly popular in terms of cheating in games, and it appropriately was named Cheat Engine. When Geometry Dash 1.9 came out on Steam, the game blew up in popularity and would have a big influx of new players and creators alike. Alongside this, using the software Cheat Engine became extremely popular in GD as well. The most well-known hacker exposals, Andromeda, Nubus, Cyclic, and more, all utilized this software, and since this was easier and more practical to use, it became a replacement for the Game Guardian exploit and SG Game Hacker app. Initially, when Cataclysm was released, the first videos of the full completion were straight up pathetic in trying to appear legitimate, and they all used Cheat Engine to speed hack a completion. The best example of doing this that managed to fool players at the time was Lyra Bandicoot, with their Cataclysm video. They stated that after 27,346 attempts, they had managed to beat Cataclysm after a death at 91%, and because of how unlike everyone else around Lyra were terrible at hiding the speed hack, players believed him. It eventually came out, of course, that the video was indeed speed hacked, which evolved into this process of detecting methods for hacking. The first thing that caught speed hackers was how in levels with custom songs, the pulsing of objects were quicker than normal footage. The reason for this was that the song in these videos were still playing at normal speed and the pulsing objects were not influenced by the speed hack, hence when the video was sped up to make it appear legitimate, the pulsing objects gave you away. This is how the well-regarded player Nubus at the time was caught speed hacking some of his verifications and achievements. When players learned of this, it would become easier for players to detect the common speed hacker, but it would however evolve from there with Cyclic. Cyclic is the most popular example of a player who managed to figure out a method that would make it harder to be spotted for speed hacking. There wasn't a whole lot that needed to be changed in the current way one would speed hack, but what had to be done was slow the song down to the same speed. For levels with main level songs, this did not matter at all, since the pulsing would always remain the same. For levels with custom songs, the pulsing is influenced by the song itself, so slowing it down to the same speed as the game would fix the incorrect pulsing. Or at least in theory, it would. The verification video of the second version of Sonic Wave that Cyclic uploaded would supposedly have been perceived as legitimate at the time, but once again it would eventually be discovered that a Sonic Wave video was speed hacked by looking at once again the pulsing objects. Even with the song speed hack, there's a very tiny difference in pulsing as opposed to normal speed, which took longer to be discovered. But when the Hell Zone was originally uploaded in March 2016, with players finding out his verification video was cut, Players also detected speed hack in his videos on a bizarre phantasm and Sonic Wave once again, and speed hacking for gain began slowly but surely disappear since it was always possible to find out if it was speed hacked or not. The only way someone would get away with it is if players exclusively played on levels with main level songs only, but even then, that would only resort to speculative findings. 
Ever since these initial accusations, there have been too many instances to count of players that have been trying to get away using speed hacking. Ironically, I am one of them who has been accused of this in public light. The outcome for a lot of these types of accusations have been all over the place, and due to how easy it became to detect speed hacking, the players who actually did try to do this either got caught for it or just stopped using it. There is one instance that appeared a few years later though, which involves a player that used to be looked up to, called N-Level. At the time of his popularity, he beat some of the hardest rated demons in the game, such as Erebus, who was deemed the hardest demon at that point. And Lobo managed to figure out a near perfect method of speed hacking and not be caught for it if you follow very specific steps. Unlike many previous players caught for cheating, and Lobo ended up confessing to cheating himself by describing the method he used. It was incredibly specific and there were a lot of steps. Smooth fix needs to be enabled, music needs to be set at 75% volume, sound effects at 50% volume, play with headphones that don't have weird audio problems, play with up arrow on slow levels and with a Logitech G502 on faster levels, speed hack at always 0.5x speed and slow the song down to half speed as well. The hacked video is then edited in HitFilm 4, which makes the audio sound perfect and the video has perfect frames in most instances. The video is then re-rendered in Vegas Pro, and the video appears legitimate. For slow levels, have your icons have glow on and no trail enabled. For fast levels, no glow and Sunic-like icons, which would be these, and then trail is optional. Out of everything else in this list of hacking methods, this one is without a doubt the most intricate in terms of steps for cheating in this game. That being said though, this method would not really work for one reason, and that is the demand of clicks in your video from the demon list, which tends to be the motive for beating the hardest demons in the game nowadays. Not only that, but they require you to showcase the raw recorded footage of your completion without edits. As such, this method would only really work for YouTube related gains, and for those players who are too blissfully unaware of cheaters in Geometry Dash. As a result, players needed to find other methods to get away with it. Before moving on, there is one more glitch that was beneficial for collecting stars in your account in a very fast manner. This involves something called Empty Level Glitch, where the game is tricked into thinking a level is empty and this involved any level, including those rated by RobTub. In a 1.9 update, the interface for a level was changed to look more updated and detailed, which included many new buttons, plus an interface showcasing what song the level has. It is unsure if the glitch worked on a PC version, but on mobile, it was rather pathetically simple to execute. All that needed to be done was hold the play button for a level with your thumb, then use the other thumb to try and delete the level simultaneously. If the exploit is successfully executed, you will end up playing an empty level but the game thinks you're playing the actual level. In around 5 seconds, you will have acquired the stars of the level without any effort. It's a rather clumsy programming mistake to allow the player to interact with the level menu in any way after you've already pressed the button to play the level. It's pretty much asking for trouble but this was later patched out in a future update. While this programmer's exploits has not been used for cheating in the manner of the previously mentioned exploits, MGO's IH opened up the possibilities of exploits that were a lot more on the nose. MGO's IH created unique exploits that had not been seen before and it was the first popular instance of someone creating exploits for Geometry Dash. Such examples of exploits would be the object limit bypass, teleporting to the end of the level, speed hacking, becoming a moderator in Geometry Dash by exploits, and etc. Majority of these mentioned exploits were released in late 2015, with the infinite jump hack being the first publicly showcased on the 26th of October 2015. As for MGO's IH himself, he would be truly exposing the security flaws by starting yet another server attack, which very likely worked in the exact same way as the one h man did back in 2014. The most controversial attack that MGO's IH performed was taking over RobTop, the developer of the game's in-game account, and began messing around with it. Such mischief was for example posting comments with explicit language, uploading levels using his account, and changing how in-game fonts were displayed for everyone. When it comes to cheating for gain however, this type of hacking is mainly oriented around star grinding since you can easily gather stars on your account and climb the top player list that exists in game. Nowadays, this list is maintained by the players themselves who are educated quite well on how to spot hackers and find out if the stars they have acquired are legitimate. But back then, there were two things that would get you banned for cheating, which was either the garbage automated system that banned legitimate players as well, or if the creator of the game rubbed up caught you. 
Some of these hacks were made publicly available and at the time, they were looked down upon since they were of course cheating methods. It would eventually evolve into being publicly acceptable by the community in later years, but we will come back to that later. With the release of the 2.0 update, a lot of the new triggers were introduced to the community, one of which being the Alpha Trigger. In short, it allows you to configure the opacity of any object between 0 to 1, and with this began one of the biggest trends this game has ever seen, the Impossible Level Showcases. Before this point, Impossible Levels had existed since 2014, it wasn't a new thing so to speak, but 2.0 allowed the ability to make it appear as if it is a player pulling off impossible parts like it was nothing by hiding the auto sections. This was especially with wave parts, where the level's silent circles would introduce what the wave was truly capable of. All that was needed to make a showcase video of this kind was to create a fully functioning auto and enable low detail mode to hide the particles of the auto. But of course, something this capable was bound to have players trying to hide beating achievements with hidden auto sections. For some time, players were getting away with it, but the glaringly obvious issue is that these completions needed to be in low detail mode, which was a pretty dead giveaway. Some players tried to elaborate on this further, like Tosh Deluxe's first verification video on Devil Vortex, who attempted to hide using auto by using other objects hidden in the level to make up for the number of objects that would be needed to make the auto. But even that did not go unnoticed. However, there are a few versions of invisible autos that technically are undetectable, with that method being nicknamed the Electro Method. This method was practically only used by a few players in a public manner, and the most well-known of these was Electro 2001, hence why it has been named the Electro Method. Another player that used it publicly was also a player named Electro, the difference with this player's name being the E and O being replaced with numbers. The first player would focus on the main list demons and the second player on challenges. As previously mentioned, the reason why impossible levels blew up was because of the ability to hide auto sections with an alpha trigger, making it look like it was some form of computer playing. But with this auto method, there's a very clever trick that only a small number of players managed to figure out. Allow me to showcase you a video of where someone is using this method, and see if you can spot anything out of the ordinary. Anything that seemed odd? Well, as a matter of fact, a fair few of the sections that I've showed you has some auto elements hidden. On immediate glance, that might not sound very unique at all, since this is what the 2.0 impossible level showcases used to do. The difference that separates them from this, however, is that this video is recorded in high detail, meaning the game will display particle effects. Hitting a pad, orb, or jumping slash gliding on a platform will display particles, and if there were any hidden pads and orbs, we should have seen them. So what is actually happening here? Well, there are some hidden gravity portals scattered across the wayports, but they are hidden in a much more complex way. It is not flawless because if you had a keen eye, you would have noticed that the gravity change effect needs to be disabled in these videos. But outside of that, what is happening is that as soon as the player has interacted with any auto element, they are immediately moved off screen with move triggers hidden in a copyable they're being in the level on. What this does is move the particle along with the object the player is interacted with, hence hiding the auto particle effect you would normally see. The crazy part about this method is that technically no one was ever exposed for it. Some people managed to reverse engineer this method, but for most cases, the players who were using this trick could never truly be caught at the time. None of the evidence that players would come up with to accuse this trick was concrete enough. Nowadays, this method would never work for what most players would aim to achieve with it because of the very strict rules that the demon list has. Not to mention that the removal of that effect in-game is a red flag immediately. There are way more practical methods available today that don't require you to hide details in-game in this manner. As such, whenever Electro 2001 would stop playing a game, one could say that the method pretty much died with them. Despite this, to this day it remains as one hell of a clever trick. However, all of the previously mentioned exploits and cheats would be made irrelevant with the upcoming applications. Before we move on, it is worth briefly mentioning the infamous Agenda Anaban. 
The Anaban Agenda was created by a player named XXOT1XX early November 2016, and in the eyes of the community, this user was deemed as someone who could hack the game in any way he so preferred. During this time, Anaban deleted one of the first ever user levels that RoboTop himself uploaded to the servers, which had the ID 130. It was the first instance of a hacker attacking users and levels, so Anaban managed to instill fear in the community, fearing that he might attack their accounts and cause them damage. His reign would not last long though, as the exploit that Anaban used to do this was patched after just one day. The day after the exploit was patched, Anaban was still able to log into certain accounts that he gathered data from though, such as the account from one of the most famous players of all time, Riot. Anaban used the level bloodbath to serve as his departure message for the small reign that he had while hacking in the community. The message in bloodbath displayed the following. Hacking this game was fun, but this is the last time you'll hear from me. Some will be happy, others might not be. I just want to say one more thing. If you have a dream or a goal that you might have thought to be impossible at one point, don't give up on it. Achieve that goal. Goodbye, Anaban. Ever since then, there have been multiple instances where players have thought Anaban returned, but that would be incorrect. The original creator of Anaban only did mischief this one day, and anyone else claiming that it was Anaban in later hacking situations would be referring to an impersonator. The name Anaban has managed to survive over the years, however, and remains to this day as a reference to a Geometry Dash hacker. Here we have the first instance of an actual macro playing the game for you, this one developed by a user named Pizzaroot, with the bot appropriately named Pizzabot. Pizzaroot had just started to make basic hacks and through this learned how to read from process memory and the understanding of X and Y positions. Pizzaroot wanted to make something using what he had learned and then came up with the idea of making a macro that plays Jump to Dash for you. It is uncertain what exactly was done during the testing phase, but initially, the first attempt was to create a normal macro that recorded clicks. The attempt of making this work was unsuccessful, so another test was done where instead of recording the clicks, the mouse input was stored using the X position, then the inputs are replayed. This was the birth of the first version of the pizza bot. This version was publicly tested and showcased on the 20th of November 2016 by having pizza bot do a run of 87% on Stereo Madness, which today doesn't seem special at all. But remember, at the time, this was the first iteration ever of a macro playing Geometry Dash for you. Yet another test that was done was the bot completing an invisible version of Heinz's Night Terrors. However, despite its capabilities, the first pizza bot version was very inaccurate for three different reasons. It was created using vb.net, it was external, and it wasn't optimized. There would be some experiments with some projects called Pizzabot X and Pizzabot AI, where Pizzabot X is a recorded macro and Pizzabot AI was a bot based off genetic algorithms. Pizzabot X implies that the bot randomizes clicks to normal distribution to try and mimic a human player, while removing errors in every wrong click. In simpler English, imagine a way part where instead of a macro that repeats the clicks that was recorded in practice, a line is randomly placed to tell the way where to go, and it removes incorrect lines until it finds the right one. The bot itself would not really extend further than this, but instead it would be extended by the creation of another bot that wanted to improve off the existing work. Next up is a bot that would seek to continue off from Pizza Roots' work on his bot, this one being made by Pavlukivan, called simply GDBot. As recently mentioned, the pizza bot was slow for three different reasons. It was created using vb.net, it was external, and it wasn't optimized. Pavlukivan then went ahead and rewrote the entire script for pizza bot in the C++ language. While this only fixed one of the performance issues, it was an improvement regardless of it still being external and unoptimized. Since he had a YouTube channel displaying hacks, it was natural for him to not expect people to think that his gameplay videos posted right after Gbot's release video was legitimate. Despite this, however, Pavlukovan became the most controversial GD exploit programmer as a result of C at the time exposing him as the worst hacker in Geometry Dash. A lot of the accusations thrown his way, however, were very unjustified, two of the most common being that his videos were in noclip or that Pavlukovan stole the code from others and did not program anything himself. Both of these statements are far from the truth. The original purpose behind GDBot was to prove that accurate botting was possible, and it was definitely shown that it was possible by the GDBot getting 50% on the impossible level exasperation, which is as far as you can get on 60Hz without alterations. 
There was never an intent to make the bot easily usable for other players, it was more to demonstrate the possibilities. It was made publicly available, but unlike the upcoming applications, it did not present itself in a user-friendly interface. In short, it was published in the manners of, here, you can use my macros yourself, but I don't care whether you will find it easy to make your own macros. At the time, I would argue that Pavlukivan was the most well-known GD programmer and was at the forefront of GD hacking. That being said though, Pavlukivan had no interest in making the same hacks for a new version of the game at the time. Pavlukivan ended up quitting from the GD community not as a result of C's exposal and bad mouthing, but because of the possibilities had already been exhausted. Ever since then, Pavlukivan has been working together with Kazedo on a mod loader project after making GDBot. It is still unfinished and still work in progress, and the intended release date is whenever 2.2 comes out. Pavlukivan viewed this as the only way to truly go beyond what could be achieved with classic GD hacks. It is a massive project, but neither Pavlukivan or Kazedo are spending massive amounts of time into it. Despite this, there are no concerns for how long it would take to finish. In 2.2, we may indeed be seeing the release of this project. The Team Hack scandal is without a doubt the most damaging server attack the game has ever experienced and will probably remain as such. Team Hacks is a team of programmers who united together to program hacks for Geometry Dash or other more elaborate applications. The original intent for the team was to focus on creating tools for the game that would be beneficial to the community, but they also wanted to push the game's limits, test the servers, and see how exploitable they are to later inform the developer Robtop about the security risks and bugs. The most dangerous exploits that they managed to discover were called SQL Injection Exploit and Account Merging Exploit. The SQL Injection Exploit was accidentally discovered by Pizza Root, and it allowed you to merge unregistered accounts that did not belong to you with registered accounts. To fill you in what this implies, before the 1.9 update was released, there was not an account system implemented into the game. Before that point, your account was represented through the mobile device you were using, which has its own identification. So two different mobile devices would have two different Geometry Dash accounts. This exploit allowed you to take any of these unregistered accounts and merge them with your own, which would give you all the levels they upload on your account. The team also discovered that through this exploit, the saved data of every account in the game was accessible as well. The passwords of accounts were hashed on the servers so they couldn't be directly accessed there, but they were also stored in save files, meaning it was easily decryptable, so you could find any account's password by downloading and then decrypting the save data. As if that wasn't bad enough, the account merging exploit allowed anyone to merge two different accounts together as long as you knew the account ID of the target, and because the previously mentioned exploit allows you to know the account data of literally everyone, the team saw all the potential harm that these exploits could cause. The team did inform Robtop about the dangerous exploits, warning him about the possibility of a server attack that was just waiting to happen. But it was through this situation that the team discovered that Robtop only acted on necessity, there had not been an attack of this type yet, and as such, he did not feel the need to attempt to fix a problem that hadn't arised yet. Essentially, this meant that Robtop would only attempt to fix the problem if it actually happened. As one would imagine, the team intended to have a bit of fun. The attack on the servers began, and the team was deliberately stealing levels to be stored over to their accounts. Over 9,000 accounts were obliterated, never to be seen again with an indefinite amount of levels lost with them. A lot of unregistered accounts were merged together with the registered Team Hacks account, with the remnants of the unregistered accounts lost forever, never to be recovered. It took months to repair the damages, and to this day, there are accounts getting hacked as a result of the scandal that happened over five years ago. Unfortunately, the story for the Team Hacks scandal is way too long to talk about in this video. There are way more details that could be discussed, but if you wish to hear more regarding that, there is a video I made some time ago discussing about this hacking scandal in detail, which you can find here. For now, let's move on to the next hack. Before moving on to the most modern methods of hacking, it is worth talking about some examples of no-clipping. In most instances, majority of the players that attempted to get away with achievements through the no-clip are painfully easy to detect. The most immediate example that comes to mind is a player who got himself known through the dumbest attempt at hacking I've ever seen. The player's name is Wargak and is for sure the most well-known hacker for trying to get away using Noclip and he's not the only one. There are way too many player examples of this out there, so mentioning all of them will be useless since we would be here all day. I will however mention one clever example in recent time where Noclip has been used where they got away with it for a short time. A player by the name of Conix, who was found cheating on a level called VSC, utilizing Noclip. 
Short story here was that he faked doing a proper run using something called no clip accuracy, which we'll get into later properly what that is. He would let himself get 99.9% .9 accuracy in no clip, and if he got any less, he would instantly die. What this would do is that it would potentially trick players into thinking that the lower was beaten, since the tiny mistake that Connix would have done most likely wouldn't have been noticed by the human eye. The no clip accuracy feature, however, was coded so that it displays the percentage accuracy in game, meaning that it would need to be hidden somehow. That was done by using a face cam that would block the part of the screen where the value showcasing that is located, hence it was caught fairly quickly for being suspicious. Outside of this, majority of cases of players caught for no clipping are really boring to talk about. For that reason, we'll just move on to the next hacking method. Here we have a ride at the FPS bypass. This is probably a controversial mention for a lot of top players, but there is something not even they can dispute about the FPS bypass. The first instance of this program was created by MGOS IH and made publicly distributable on the 5th of November 2016. MGOS IH's bypass removed the FPS cap entirely since you couldn't limit FPS with it. In short, this worked by forcing the game to run at a set number of frames per second, which if you're unfamiliar with Geometry Dash might sound pointless and just a visual gadget. But what this does is make Geometry Dash ignore the frame rate of your monitor and bypasses the forced V-sync of the game completely and runs the game at its max potential, as the game does not check how many frames you're running the game at. This will influence the physics pretty significantly, and in some cases, making it easier to play the game. Whether you believe it to be an alternative to getting a monitor with high FPS to see it as a means of cheating, a fact that both sides would need to agree on is that the FPS bypass is an exploit by definition. There are two questions that are really important to tackle on this topic. Is using the FPS bypass considered cheating? And is running the game on higher hertz considered cheating? As for the first question, currently, FPS bypass is cheating. Now of course, this is a topic with no true objective point of view. People have different opinions on what should and should not be considered cheating, but I believe there's a decent way to describe FPS bypass versus high refresh rate. Cheating by definition, and in this context, is the act of gaining advantage over dishonesty and unfairness. There's different ways to play a game, and as long as you use means given to you by the game itself without an error being the case of any of them, it will usually be considered proper or legit. However, that line between legitimacy and cheating becomes blurry the further you delve into taking advantage of bugs, using external tools, exploits, and etc. While the FAS bypass lands on an uncertain spot between these two sides, it certainly is a tool that modifies the way the game is intended to work in order to give an arguably unnecessary advantage to the player, using it over someone who isn't, which in most other communities would immediately fall under the cheating label. With that said too, even the creators of the FPS Bypass would 100% tell you the exact same thing that I'm saying. The FPS Bypass is by definition an exploit, and nothing will change that. Exclaiming that the FPS Bypass is not an exploit is a straight up lie. With the second question, this would definitely be the most controversial to answer, but thankfully, by basing the answer off the previous question, it is fairly simple. Compared to the FPS Bypass, it is NOT cheating to enable VSync with higher hertz. Enabling VSync with a higher refresh rate than 60Hz changes the way the game works due to the way VSync affects the game's physics. You may ask, why isn't that also considered cheating? There's a few reasons for that. The most important ones is the possibility of screen tearing happening without VSync on higher refresh rate, where people are simply enabling it due to not really knowing how it works or what difference it makes. Avoiding screen tearing by setting a higher refresh rate down to 60Hz for one single game is a fairly annoying and tedious process in comparison to enabling a single option and complaints of why wouldn't I use something I paid money for. All these are valid on their own, but it also doesn't change the fact that this is still taking advantage of something that wasn't implemented properly. Whether it's FPS bypass or high refresh rate from a monitor, both of them stem from the same problem. They abuse a bug. The only real difference is that one of them is a legitimate exploit by definition, and the other one is hardware unintended for the game. Now, with that extremely long description of what the FPS bypass actually is, what players ended up using this to cheat? Of course with what was just discussed, it is rather tone deaf to start calling out players that use FPS bypass, but there are some players out there that lied about using them, or just straight up lied about the number of frames per second they arranged for when playing. Two examples of this will be the players Sunix and Metaman Z. Sunix did a number of achievements such as Bloodlust and Plasma Pulse Finale using the FPS bypass in secret, which at the time was a banned application to use on the demon list. This would of course change within time, and the ban was eventually lifted. Metaman C went further than Sunix, however, and was openly using the FPS bypass, which wasn't what the controversy surrounding Metaman Z was involved in. 
The problem with him was that his later 2.1 verifications utilized FPS bypass, but the amount of allowed frames per second was way above what was actually allowed by the demon list. The FPS bypass would for a time remain as a point of controversy, as the thin line between legitimacy and cheating was so unsecure that players weren't sure what to do. That was until an evolved version of the FPS bypass came out. As if talking about the FPS bypass wasn't controversial enough, here we have the bypass that pushed the FPS bypass gimmick to be allowed in the first place. This exploit was created by Powered by Pi and was one among other exploits that this user made. Powered by Pi has created a few other things like texture loader, a fix for the invisible dual glitch, and is a contributor to a new mod loader for Geometry Dash. The bypass works very identically to the FPS bypass where the end outcome is the exact same. It forces the game to run at a set number of frames per second. But what separates this from the FPS bypass is that instead of changing the actual game, it modifies your system in a way to make the game think that your monitor hertz is higher than it actually was. The motive for as to why this wasn't viewed as a cheat by some players is because it didn't modify the game specifically, so in terms of the game itself, it is intended behavior. Since then, it has managed to integrate itself as an essential tool for many players in the game, and many of the hardest demons today are verified using a form of FPS bypass. The thing is though, with everything that was mentioned when talking about the FPS bypass, and how by definition that is an exploit, what makes the bypass truly different? Well, nothing. Even if it doesn't affect the game itself, it still is by definition an exploit that allows you to do things that other users normally wouldn't be able to do. It still is a tool that modifies the way the game is intended to work in order to give an arguably unnecessary advantage to the player, using it over someone who isn't. Whether it is the FPS bypass or the bypass, the natural outcome is the exact same, and both exploits are used for the same purpose. Trying to say that it is not cheating just because it affects your computer instead of the game itself is just outright dishonest. Much like the parallel between FPS and bypass versus high refresh rate, every method that involves configuring the frames per second using exploits are for the purpose of abusing this bug. There's no hiding the motive here just because it is approached differently. And now we have a ride at the most well-known and most used software of all time when it comes to hacking in Geometry Dash, the Mega Hack. It has a long story to be told on how it ended up into what it has become today, so I'm going to be discussing the story of its origins. Mega Hack started as an idea for Absolutist's 5000 subscriber special, where he gathered some simple hacks for a time, plus a few bonus stat hacks, and shoved it all into a cheat table, where you had to open it with Cheat Engine. At the time, there was only about 13 hacks in it, but it still gained a lot of traction, especially for a time where Absolute had only released some individual hacks, and GD Exploits were still in their infancy. With time, Mega Hack version 2 and version 3 came out, and were basically the same as each other, just for 2.0 and 2.1 respectively. Unlike the first iteration though, they were their own individual program instead, but they flew under the radar since they didn't have many of the core hacks, such as Copy Hack, No Clip, and Instant Complete. But the program would keep evolving, and the next version, version 4, was the first fully polished and successful iteration, with an actual GUI instead of a console window, with a good amount of hacks, and was the first time that people saw the software as more of a mod pack instead of something that was used to cheat with. It included basically every exploit you'd ever need, approximately 60 in total, so now a folder wasn't needed on a desktop to keep all of the individual exploits in. This version also marked the beginning of the end of making individual exploits on Absolute's end, as before it was just making an exploit and seeing if users were interested. With this new motion for how to approach updating the program, the Mega Hack version 5 was born. Mega Hack version 5 is definitely what put Mega Hack on the map, turning it into the de facto hack, although it almost never came out. When Absolute started working on it, 2.11 had already been out for a couple of months, and at the time, 2.2 felt like it was just on the horizon. Quite the irony, right? As a result, spending a few months trying to get 100 hacks into one program at the time felt like a bad idea. Absolute ended up rewriting the project once and almost dropped the project a couple of times due to personal reasons and a worry of a looming update, but finally ended up releasing it after almost 4 months. The success of version 5 was insane, and it didn't take long before it was common to see most active players and creators in the community using it openly as it was incredibly practical keeping all different exploits contained within one software. It set the standard for future software upgrades, and to this day, Mega Hack version 5 is the most popular GD software with over 750,000 downloads, accounting for 80% of all Mega Hack downloads. Its success can be attributed to word of mouth and it appearing more and more in content creators' videos slash streams. But even after all of this, the story doesn't quite end there for Mega Hack. 
After version 5's release, Absolute slowly began losing interest in Geometry Dash and quit for just under a year, occasionally coming back to the game and eventually coming back to work on a Minecraft-style hat client, which to him was practically the end game. Absolute worked on version 6 on and off for about 10 months total, almost solely focused on its UI engine, which is completely custom and built for purpose, something at the time he had no previous experience doing. After finishing its first iteration, it was integrated into the 1.9 Geometry Dash Private Services U7 update with just four exploits as a sort of very early alpha of what was to become version 6, with a janky UI and a lot of missing elements, but the basics were there. A fundamental testing ground, you could say. Shortly after, Absolute began working on a rewrite that looked more like a Minecraft hack client and what MegaHack is today, organized into tabs and almost purely checkbox based, adding scaling, animations and proper event handling. While this version was a lot more polished, it wasn't up to scratch internally, so Absolute rewrote the entire UI engine once more, focusing on making it more maintainable in the long run. Around this time, Corona lockdown hit and sped up development time significantly. As a result, MegaHack version 6 was released on the 14th of May 2020 and became an immediate success, surpassing the wildest expectations even in the first 24 hours. This release was met with some controversy, however, since version 6 was the first release that cost money. People began claiming it was quote-unquote illegal to do this, but this controversy died down after a couple of weeks. The addition's only percentage and 2DP accurate percentage were two large factors to version 6's success since they were available nowhere else and it made mega hack users instantly recognizable. People began asking what could be seen in the top corners of the game when watching streams and videos, and due to its practicality it was highly sought after, hence helping the growth of mega hack. The FPS and CPS counters, no clip accuracy and show hitboxes in later updates achieved this too, and contributed to the same thing. Mega Hack version 7, the most recent iteration when making this video, began development when 2.2's teaser dropped, intended to make the 2.2 transition easier, while it uses the same UI engine with minor improvements and with its core being rewritten to support multiple GD versions at once. It also worked a lot better internally with integrated features and now they were more of a focus of MegaHack. The original intent for version 7 was for it to be only available for 2.2, but after some time in development it made sense to release it for 2.1 as well. The status tab and the new gameplay related additions helped push for the update a ton, along with the content being made on it. Despite its rocky release with a good few bugs it originally introduced, it was by far the most successful release ever by views, revenue and reach. And with that said, that covers the general story regarding the mega hack. I could mention endless tricks that players have come up with, that they have attempted to cheat in baiting levels, and if I were to discuss each individual method, we would be here all day. With MegaHack establishing itself as an integrated foundation for how the community functions, there will be some pretty revolutionary exploits and applications made that integrate perfectly with the nature of MegaHack. The creation of taskbots has since then been the go-to for making showcases for levels, as all it demands you to do is a full practice run of the level and it will perfectly replicate what you've done previously at least in theory. In this community, they are known by entirely different names, but at the core of programming, they are all the same thing. A TAS. TAS stands for Tool Assisted Speedrun, which is very popular among making perfect speedruns in video games that humans cannot achieve. I'm not going to be able to talk about all the bots that exist, since there are a few private ones that hasn't seen any popularity. I will be talking about four of them, that have managed to build a hype of what has shaped showcasing videos into what they are today. When the 2.1 version of Geometry Dash was released, it was the update where the exploits and modders began to arise. The first instance of a kind of task was from a bot named Xbot, created by Andex Arts. Andex Arts began experimenting with making bots and initially experimented with the C languages, but during the testing phase, Andex Arts discovered that the C sharp language is too slow for this kind of workflow. That was when he found out about the existence of PizzaBot and GDBot created by PizzaRoot and Pavlukovan. The first ever released Xbox version used the GD bot as engine, and on the 19th of April 2017, the first video of the bot was released along with a download link. Shortly after that, Andex Arts made his own C++ external engine and worked on an upgrade to the bot nicknamed Smart Record. Smart Record was in beta and would remain in beta for a while after he temporarily quit the game. Two years later, someone texted him saying that he would want to pay Andex Arts if he would continue the project once more, and as such, he went back to improving the bot. While Andex Arts was working on improvements of the external engine, another program by the name of Adaf Kaif, uh, Adaf, 
came up with some internal additions for the bot which would later become the XBot Pro, while the external engine was called XBot Lite. The internal engine had around 150 lines of code and over time, a lot of features were added that improved the engine. In the end, however, Andex Arts had to quit due to schoolwork and that ever since then, there is a much more competitive market for macros and exploits in Geometry Dash. Documented on the 5th of May 2021, XBot had over 8,600 users and the macro database consists of over 1,112 macros. Other modders within Geometry Dash would expand further on the work that was done with the XBot, which would eventually evolve into the next step for TaskBots, the YBot. On June 2020, the makers of the program XBot, Adaf and Andex Arts, contacted Firecubes about how they were working on the XBot and Firecubes caught such an interest that he wanted to become a beta tester for them. But this request to beta test the bot was denied by Andex Arts and as a result, Firecubes went ahead and created an upgraded version called YBot. He had gotten some assistance in making it by Adaf and on the 3rd of June 2020 he sent a message on the Discord server for the XBot stating that how he had made a new bot called YBot. At the time, XBot was the first internal bot that was injected into the game, which YBot was as well. But unlike the XBot, the YBot was not perfect, but unlike the XBot, it was way more consistent, where it either always failed or always succeeded. Rumors spread about the existence of this new bot, and Vitesse reached out to Firecubes about it, went to beta test. Firecubes accepted the request and invited Vitesse and other beta testers to a server where they would bug test the software. Players began talking about the YBot in the XBot Discord server and ended up becoming so interested in this upgrade of a bot that they were willing to pay for it. Multiple requests were sent to Firecubes' way with PayPal donations and trade for the YBot, which in numbers like $50 to $110. Initially, players began to believe that this was a scam due to the insane pricing that the bot used to have around the price tag of $40. It was eventually brought down to a much more reasonable price of $4, but even then, the community was dismissive of it considering that the amount of money was spent on a game that cost about $4 as well. But in the end, these discussions died down and the YBot ended up becoming the official go-to for botting. YBot became just as popular as the XBot and became an alternative to the other. One of the main features that the YBot introduced was that it was possible to record a macro using in-game practice mode, where all you had to do was play through the entire level in practice and a computer would mostly replicate it perfectly. Another addition was practice fix, which made the bot a lot more accurate and wouldn't fail as often as it did in previous versions. Updates came along and eventually on the 9th of April 2021, the 1.0 version of YBot was released, released at the price of $4 per user. YBot 1.9 was released on 8th of November 2021, and it introduced a completely rewritten bot with UI and extra utilities inspired by another bot called OBOT. These utilities included an auto-clicker which clicked at a specified clicks per second and the ability to select between player 1 and player 2 in a duel. It also had a major change in how macros worked, where usually bots simulate clicks where the recorded macro says to click. The YBot introduced something called physics modification, which meant that every frame the bot stores the coordinates of the player info, and when playing the macro back, it feeds that information back into the player instead of just mimicking the clicks. The next update to the YBot is 2.0, and quoting Firecubes, he aims to make it the best bot to have ever existed, hence try repeating the success and hype that the original YBot managed to attain. It is seemed to be like a macro studio, where you get a video editor interface and the ability to select whatever level you want in game, and be able to edit it in real time. A very ambitious project, but possible to make. Much like the later Megahack versions, it'll have a plugin feature where it displays an effect on the screen each click or plugin where an AI learns a level for you instead of you having to record. There was at one point the attempt of making an editor for the YBot macros, but it has remained dormant of progress ever since its original announcement. In current time, the YBot has stagnated as a result of botting as a whole, calming down a fair bit. There are also other bots that came out that would evolve from YBot, which will be discussed next. The next bot that would evolve from YBot was called Zedbot. Sterling creative with names here, I know. The Zedbot was developed by Fig and started as very much a passion project. The motivation for this was that he wanted to use XBot and YBot, but didn't have the money to do so. As such, Fig picked up modding and C++ as a language around December 2020 with the goal of making his own bot, but modding at the time was not well documented and difficult to pick up. CBOS's initial release took around two days to program and was finished around February 2021 where it was a free bot and rivaled the accuracy of both XBot and YBot. It grew in popularity very quickly as a result of rumors and popular players publicly using it. Like FNM04 who made a video using it, Fig went on an updating spree, releasing around 10 different updates in one week, which only increased his popularity. 
When the Discord server for the Sedbot had reached around 1000 members, Tosh the Lux reached out to Fig with concerns about the demon list and how hackers could potentially exploit Zedbot to make Fig completions. After a bit of internal discussion, Fig decided to make Zedbot a paid bot, and Fig has been steadily releasing updates since. One final bot worth mentioning is the so-called DDHOR bot, created by Andre. The story of the DDHOR bot begins all the way back in 2019 when PizzaBot and Pavlukuin's DD bot was a popular choice. According to Andre, the DDHOR bot started out as a bit of an insider joke with a group of friends in real life where the bot's name is a reference to one of his friends named Dahir, aka the robot. This version of the bot was never made public and at the time, the project was soon shelved because unlike the other bots, it was very inaccurate. Fast forward to the end of 2020 and the project would gain reason to resume once more. The motive behind reinitiating the project came from Andre talking in the Geometry Dash programming Discord server when the rumors of Firecubes as his Y bot at the time sitting at the outrageous price of $40. While this would eventually change, Andre found the price for the Y bot to be ludicrous, but he wanted to see for himself how hard it could be to make a bot that worked in pretty much the same way as the Y bot. He also wanted players to have an affordable option that didn't cost a lot of money. That being said, all these aforementioned bots can all be utilized for trying to hide the fact that you're cheating, and unlike any other method before it, this one there technically isn't anything that can catch you for using it. Thing is though, you would end up putting yourself in a situation where there are certain things that need to be hidden, such as attempt count and clicks. The demon list accounted for this by requiring that you have some form of raw footage including clicks, and for most instances, this method works. There are a few more exploits, bots, and glitches that could be mentioned as cheating or hacking methods, but there are a few complications with them. The most common issue is that they were simply not known enough or relevant enough that they were seen as an ideal choice for cheating among most players, hence there isn't a big story related to it. The other issue, which much like when I made the 312 bugs video, there are some glitches and bypasses that would be dangerous to mention in the community for the fear of players abusing them. So with this, I'm making sure that what has been mentioned in this video can be discovered one way or another if within the right circumstances. You may be worried that me having made this video will increase the influx of cheaters who try to gain publicity for doing something they didn't actually do legitimately. Understandably so, this is a pretty big problem since the game has Game Boy level security. But with that said, I have also come to learn of some methods of finding cheaters that are without flaw, and no matter what method you decide to cheat in, they can 100% catch you with these methods. So moral of the story, don't cheat for gain. You will not get away with it anymore. And with that said, that concludes the history of hacking in Geometry Dash. Thank you all so much for watching this video, and I will see you all next time.